morning, everybody. Um, today, I, I want to be uh, talking with you about how we're working at Weill Cornell Medical College to really foster and create a culture of entrepreneurship. Um, in particular, uh, from my background as uh, a long-standing member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Healthcare Ventures, having had a number of partnerships myself uh, with the pharmaceutical industry and being on the board of directors of Bristol-Myers Squibb for 16 years, um, I really feel there is a lot to be gained by the formation of uh, new companies and by increasing what we call translational research collaborations between academia and the biopharmaceutical industry. So basically my topic today is um, how do you turn nascent ideas in the lab at a medical school into new therapies in the clinic. So we want to inspire our faculty at Weill Cornell um, to make disruptive innovations. Um, the, the, the kind of discoveries that really shift the paradigm. But the truth of the matter is often the um, innovations that make a real difference can be rather subtle. Um, they're in a, they can be incremental changes in the way things have been done in the past, so we also want to encourage our faculty at Weill Cornell to translate these incremental improvements um, to the real world so that uh, they become the basis for successful enterprises. enterprises. So I came almost two years ago now, and my goal is really to put Weill Cornell on the map um, as a leader in innovation and in turning research discoveries into new therapeutic modalities for patients, new paradigms of patient care. If I could have the next slide, do I? Oh, thank you, of course, it's right in front of me. Um, so, look, we have enormous opportunities in New York City. Um, I, I think New York City is rapidly establishing itself as an East Coast leader in the biotech world. Uh, the share, of, uh, New York share of, of VC investments has doubled over the past 10 years, I don't have to tell you that, um, and, and surpassed New England, um, primarily due to growth in the tech industry um, and the life sciences. 60% of U.S. pharmaceutical industry is located in the New York metropolitan region. We now have the Alexandria Center for Life Sciences, uh, which is state-of-the-art place, and, and of course the Cornell Tech Campus uh, being built on the Roosevelt Island, which has a healthier life hub. Um, and indeed, the first two faculty members recruited to the Tech Campus have joint appointments at Weill Cornell Medical College because they are working in the healthier life hub. So I think we're, we're really uh, in an innovation um, ecosystem at this point. Now, biomedical science, to me, is really at an exhilarating moment because for the first time since I've been a scientist, and it's been a long time, we are actually at the point, due to the advent of very new technology and the human genome sequence, et cetera, we are at a point where we can actually talk about translational medicine as a real thing, we can actually begin to translate discoveries into the laboratory into improved clinical care at a faster pace. I call this the bench-to-bedside approach, um, and it, it requires the involvement of not only our basic scientists and our translational researchers, but also our clinicians. And so we're trying very hard at Weill Cornell to get these groups together because we need these cross-cutting interdisciplinary teams. It is the future, um, in my opinion, of biomedicine. So we're opening a new uh, biomedical research building uh, this January, and that's given us an opportunity to dramatic, dramatically expand the research enterprise at Weill Cornell. To me, um, success is always measured by the talent of the individuals you can recruit. It comes down to that. Matter, what they do matters less than how innovative and talented they are. And so we were thrilled to be able to recruit from Harvard uh, Lou Cantley to head our new cancer center. Um, we also were happy to recruit Augustine Choi, also from Harvard, to head our new department of, our, our department of medicine. Both of these individuals not only are outstanding basic scientists, but they've also um, formed companies. Uh, both of them have, and, um, and, are, and as well are highly funded by the NIH. So I'm very intent on recruiting new researchers uh, with experience 
uh, in corporate research agreements, in founding companies, and the, who bring a really entrepreneurial spirit to the Weill Cornell campus. Now, the reality, of course, is that you need significant um, financial investments to fuel this uh, new era of translational research. Um, and academic medical centers, you know, are often not well equipped to make that translation, to translate a basic science discovery, take it to the next uh, level. You know, it takes typically 10 years for a new drug to, uh, to reach the market. So there are many steps we have to go through. Um, a new drug, um, a research discovery made in the lab has to be validated in vivo proof of principle. You know, then you're entering multi-year clinical trials, and finally you're going through the FDA approval process, which has proven to be increasingly arduous, as we all know. Um, I think the marriage between pharmaceutical companies and academic medical centers is vital. It's certainly on the, um, the an exponential curve in terms of such alliances happening. And of course, pharma companies have the resources that we don't have at academic medical centers um, to do this kind of work. And we have to remember, this is a very difficult time for academic medical centers and for biomedical research institutes in general throughout the country. We've had a, a real-time 20% decrease over the last decade in NIH dollars. Um, and this year, the budget's been cut by another 5%, which Countrywide lead is 1.5, over 1.5 billion dollars and 700 fewer research projects that are going to be funded. And I don't see it, anything good happening soon. Maybe you do, but uh, I think we're in a, a uh, unusually uh, dim place right now. Um, I think as Francis Collins said in some recent op-ed piece, this is the blackest time, most dismal time in, at the NIH for federal funding that he's ever seen. So clearly, if you want to be around as an academic medical center 10 years from now, you've got to be looking for sources of alternative funding. And I think these alternative sources, the biopharmaceutical industry, venture capital, private foundations, and philanthropy are great and are actually the best ways to bring new discoveries into actual clinical care, improve patient care. So I want to give you an example of uh, a few of the companies that have been formed at Weill Cornell and talk a little bit about a very new launch of our Tri-Institutional Drug Discovery Center. So one of the companies um, uh, was formed by um, Hazel Zito. It's called Stealth Peptides. It was founded by Hazel in uh, 2005. She's in our Department of Pharmacology. So she's designed small peptide molecules that target the mitochondria and, uh, and that restore energy balance when the mitochondria become dysfunctional. Uh, she's done a, done a lot of experimental models that indicate that these small peptides can actually be beneficial in a range of different diseases with high unmet medical needs. Uh, the lead compound for her company now is a compound called Bendavia, and it's uh, currently in phase two clinical trials, um, looking for its ability to reduce damage in the setting of heart attacks and also to improve kidney function in uh, patients who have um, severe high blood pressure. The lead investor in stealth pep peptides is a Hong Kong-based group called Morningside Ventures. Um, it's invested more than $60 million to date. Uh, Stealth Peptides has, l has licensed all of the technologies uh, developed in the Zito lab and uh, for clinical development. And she's, she's developed a rather interesting model. She has developed a model of academic industry collaboration in which all of the preclinical studies are not only validated by her lab, but they're validated by a, a large number of independent academic labs using different animal mod models multiple species, different diseases. And I think this addresses an issue in the pharmaceutical industry where we hear that, gee, we can't repeat 70% of the discoveries um, that what we see in academia. So here she's validated this, you know, really worldwide. Um, and, and, it, and it was academic clinical leaders that helped to plan the phase two uh, trial for Bendavia and that is looking very promising. 
Another um, outstanding uh, company was founded by Sheila Nirenberg. Uh, it's called Bionic Sight, and Sheila just received a MacArthur Genius Award for this work. Um, she's a neuroscientist um, who's been focused on figuring out ways to treat uh, blindness. So uh, first, she, she's, a, she's a biophysicist, really, and a mathematician. And so first, she deciphered the neural code that the eye uses to communicate with the brain. And then she developed a prosthetic device. Now, there are other prosthetic devices, but her device converts the images that come into the eye into light impulses that are then sent to the brain and interpreted as visual Im images. And unlike other retinal prosthetics, her artificial um, retina incorporates gene therapy, and it uses a pair of eyeglasses. It does not require surgery. So at the, you look at the bottom half of the slide, and when I showed this to our Board of Trustees and Board of Overseers uh, last January, there was an audible gasp from the audience because you can see, here's an image of a baby's face. This is what it would look like on your standard prosthetic, and look what it looks like on using Sheila Nirenberg. So she can actually restore sight to bl totally blind individuals. Um, so we, we licensed the IP uh, covering her technology um, into a startup company called Bionic Sight, and uh, she is in the midst of trying to uh, raise several million dollars in seed investment um, because she's gung-ho to, to start a phase one clinical trial. Those are, those are um, two examples. Let me just give you, um, there are other startups by our Wild Cornell faculty and I'm going to talk in a minute about Shaheen Rafi's work in stem cell um, transplants. Um, other faculty members who've started companies, um, uh, uh, Suzanne, who's chief of nephrology, uh, is, is now has, has developed a test that measures kidney rejection. He's a transplant uh, physician. Tom Fahey is an endocrine surgeon. He's developed... Um, uh, tests, diagnostic tests for thyroid cancer, which is his main interest. Um, Francis Barani, who's in our pharmacology department, uh, sorry, in our microbiology and immunology department, has two startups called Cofiron and iCare DX. The latter, for which he is seeking funding, has developed an extremely sensitive test to detect um, colon cancer at very early stages. Sammy Jaffrey, uh, is in our pharmacology department. He's creating um, nucleic acid-based nano devices. And then Ron Crystal, who's chair of genetic medicine, um, he's in the process of creating companies for cardiac gene therapy. And he also has an anti-nicotine vaccine and has recently published his work on an anti-cocaine vaccine. And we have, we have other um, companies on the drawing board. Let me just spend a minute on, on Shaheen's uh, work, which I, I think is just fantastic. So he made a huge discovery about two years ago, because part of the problem with stem cell therapy is generating the cells in adequate quantities and being able to differentiate them from a pluripotent state into the tissue, into the cell type you want. So what Shaheen discovered was that you can purify fetal stem cells from amniotic fluid after a labor and delivery. So this is leftover fluid. You can purify fetal amniotic cells, and by using a cocktail of four different factors, you can differentiate them into blood vessels. And why, why is this uh, important? Well, here, what we're, actually what I'm showing you, the endothelium is in green, and blood cells are in red, so he can not only Differentiate shade these into endothelial cells, which are cells that line the vessels, he can then take these endothelial cells and differentiate them into red blood cells. Um, so he, he's, there are other technologies like IPS and, um, and uh, somatic nuclear transfer. These are difficult technologies. This is, you know, you got a lot of amniotic fluid available and be able, being able to create uh, millions and millions of stem cells that you can differentiate um, into whatever you want is, is very, very powerful. So his company is called Angiocrine. Um, he has raised uh, some funding for it um, already. But look what else he can do. He can actually, and this is amazing to me, he can actually 
make blood vessels that can be implanted. And this is important because it turns out that you can reverse tissue damage in organs by providing vascular supply. So a lot of the damage you see is due to a lack of oxygen. It's ischemic damage. And if you can put blood vessels, actually implant real microfabricated blood vessels, this, this could um, you know, potentially be, be very, very um, groundbreaking. And he can even, um, and you'll, you'll see this, and we're doing this, he's doing this right now, this is, um, you're gonna, what you're gonna see is, so he's taken stem cells from amniotic fluid, converted them into endothelial cells, and is delivering them to the heart, to the area that has been damaged by ischemia. And you can see that the endothelial cells are sprouting, they're making vessels, and that this, this region now um, is healing nicely without fibrosis. So some of this is pie in the sky, but I, I really think for the first time that we are at a point where gene therapy and stem cell therapy might become a reality. Um, thanks to these kinds of uh, groundbreaking discoveries. Now, in addition to, um, to uh, starting a company, uh, you know, entrepreneurship to my mind is, is any activity that takes advantage of economic opportunities. So we have put into place at Weill Cornell in the last year um, a set of new initiatives that really are designed to complement and usher in the whole, and a spree of entrepreneurship and innovation to, to help professionalize our um, interactions with industry. I've established um, a new office of biopharma alliances and research collaborations. Um, and this office is responsible for going out, beating the bushes, and um, introducing our patent portfolio to interested uh, individuals in the private sector. And so we probably have 20 now alliances that we are in the midst of, uh, of forming. Um, I think I've got a list of some of them here. So these are just a, uh, some of our projects in-house now uh, that are actively being negotiated um, for sponsored research agreements or other kinds of agreements. Um, in addition, we want to be at Weill Cornell the place where industry comes to do clinical trials, and that means we need to be professional. We need to streamline the process of implementing critical trials at, at our medical center, and so we have formed a joint clinical trial office with our partner hospital, New York Presbyterian, which is now professionally staffed, as we want to be the place that Pfizer comes to when they say, gee, we have a drug that targets this particular mutation in lung cancer you know, the mutation of the ALK kinase, for example, in Zalcori. We want to be able to say, because we will have universal consent forms, we will phenotype and genotype everybody who walks across our threshold, we'll be able to say, you know what, we have 64 patients who have this mutation. And it might not always be in lung cancer. As we know, these mutations go across organ systems. Um, so we want to make Walt well, Cornell uh, a very attractive partner for biopharma and, and medical device companies. Now, the most exciting thing we've done recently is this, uh, and we announced this, we launched this uh, October 1st. Um, we just established what we're calling the Tri-Institutional Therapeutics Discovery Institute, or the Tri-I-TDI. And I think this is really an innovative, cutting-edge model. So we, we're at 1300 York Avenue. We call York Avenue the Four Corners because we have Wild Cornell, Rockefeller, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and New York Presbyterian Hospital there. So, you know, together, as, as partners together, we're far more attractive, we think, to the private sector, and we can leverage each other's strengths. So we got together to form a nonprofit, 5013C, to engage in basic drug discovery. Um, so we share that the, the, this institute is going to be located on the 16th floor of our new Belfer Research Building. Um, 
we are going to share research cores, space, administration. I mean, what's the point of having three separate drug discovery centers when you can do it together? And uh, each institution will propose projects. And, and what, what we're aiming for is that valley of death, that sweet spot, where we have a tool compound, but it is not optimized. So how do we introduce medicinal chemistry, which is traditionally not very good in academia, into academia? And what we did was to partner with Takeda as our first uh, corporate sponsor. It's a, a rather novel alliance that's going to focus on development, on the development in, in the small molecule space. We're still open for other agreements that uh, would focus on the um, biologic space or molecular imaging, which is also, we've established a new molecular imaging institute on the 15th floor of the Belfer Research Building, and have hired some excellent uh, researchers into that. So Takeda is going to contribute 10 to 20 medicinal chemists who will be embedded on the 16th floor of the Belfer Research Building, working intimately with our faculty, our biologists and our um, structural biologists and so on. And the tri institution of the three of us owns all the intellectual property. And in fact, Takeda uh, does not actually have a right of first refusal. They have a right of first look since they'll be there. So we're, we're very excited about this. We think it's kind of an unusual structure and it leaves wide open um, the door for uh, other industry relationships in additional fields. So this does not in any way prevent any of the institutions from forming other, other agreements. Finally, I just want to end by, by um, talking a little bit about partnerships between individual research laboratories and the pharmaceutical industry, which I think are really the future here. And I want to see more of that at Wild Cornell. And, I've been lucky enough to engage in a couple of those, and the, the last one was a very good partnership with Merck. We happened to have isolated a gene serendipitously that we thought was going to be important in the immune system. Turned out it did nothing in the immune system, but the animals had extremely high bone mass and with normal morphology and shape of the bones. So this became you know, a very exciting target for osteoporosis. We got a lot of calls, and we ended up going with Merck. And this was really a true research alliance. Um, Merck you know, considered it their sort of flagship. This is how these kinds of alliances should be conducted. We were at a project team at Merck and a project team at Harvard, which is where I was then. And uh, we, we worked together. We designed a screen to screen their libraries. They came up with compounds. We identified compounds, and we would test them in our lab, in our, in our bone forming assays, and so on. And we met monthly. Uh, we are on the phone, email all the time. So, you know, I'm, I'm very happy we were able to transfer this project to uh, Wild Cornell, and we're about to sign an agreement with um, another company to continue moving forward with it. So, I think, look, as long as um, in academia uh, we remain transparent uh, and we, you know, follow. Louis Brandeis's dictum that sunlight is the best of disinfectants, if things open and transparent, I think these alliances, you know, are the way to go to really get these discoveries into um, real meaningful new treatments for patients. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna end there and ask for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Um, so I, I think whenever I see uh, in, uh, presentations going into the science, you know, I always get really excited by the potential for some of these things. But then I get frustrated because I'm like, how are we going to make these things see the light of day? And it was great that you ended with some insight on the collaborations with some of these large pharmaceutical companies. And so the first question that I got from a neighbor over here was, um, what is the role that faculty plays into bringing these innovations to market? And also, what sorts of conflicts come up uh, amongst faculty? So, you know, we need to encourage our faculty to translate their discoveries into things that are real life in terms of patient care. And in fact, you know, that's why the federal government gave us back our IP in, you know, in, in, in the Bayh-Dole Act on the condition that we do our best to use these taxpayer, taxpayer dollars that we've received 
to make things better for patients. I mean, the patients at, at, you know, at Weill Cornell, the patients are really the center of everything we do. We always keep our eye on the patients. But faculty need education. They need training. They don't know how to write a business plan. Um, we need to be very aggressive about going around and contacting all our faculty, finding out what's happening in each lab, what, what discoveries are actionable, what are, might be appropriate or attractive for further development. And that's our job to do, which is why I, um, you know, I actually poached the development officer that I had at uh, Harvard who'd been so good. And he, uh, he was living in New York anyway, so um, <laughs> we are, we are you know, strengthening our organization. Our, our, uh, our um, tech transfer organization so that we can meet the needs of our faculty. They are thrilled, I can tell you. Um, this was not a, a priority uh, in the past and uh, was not optimal, and now I have faculty emailing me saying, oh, this is so great, I met with so-and-so, and now I'm gonna be talking to Roche, or I'm gonna be talking to you know, Merck or Pfizer or whatever. So I, I feel like the, the, the faculty are innately entrepreneurial, was we need to help them get there. And culturally, is it acceptable, you know, amongst faculty for people to get involved, not only in large companies like Roche, but also startups? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we want to be an entrepreneurial culture. And I've said that since I arrived in January 2012. We've made steps in that direction. And again, I think this is, this is because, it's not just because we need funding to keep the research going, we truly want to, you know, translate our discoveries uh, into patient care. Most of us are MDs, uh, as I am, and you know, I'd really like to see osteoporosis is the most common disease in the world, and the treatments for it are pretty unsatisfactory, and most of them actually inhibit the resorption of bone as opposed to forming new bone. We need to be able to form new bone in the setting of of uh, osteoporosis, in the setting of lytic lesions and cancer, painful lytic lesions and cancer, and inflammatory arthritis where you have erosions uh, of the bone. We need to form new bone. So I would love to be able to say that I came up with a compound that inhibits this gene that we discovered by accident and that leads to a new treatment for osteoporosis. And I think that's how our faculty feel. That's great. Um, so we have a lot of business leaders in the audience that are experienced entrepreneurs. Is there any role that they can play in helping faculty bring their ideas to market? Absolutely, we need all the help we can get. I um, established with um, the help of Gene Resnick, who I think is in the audience, we established a um, entrepreneurship council. Um, we are trying to raise funds right now for an accelerator, we're calling it the Daedalus Fund, so that we can get over that, that early time before these discoveries are attractive to VC firms or angel investors. They're a little too early, so you need you know, $50,000, $100,000 to just make the next step. We just, gave, we just came up with those funds for one of our wonderful investigators to get him to the next stage where you know, he can go around and talk to VCs. The, our door is open. Our door is open. We want to. Um, we want to do this mm -hmm. at Wild Cornell. We want to. We really do want to translate these discoveries. We think we have a lot of interesting discoveries here. A lot of interesting works going on. And I, we, I recruited 22 new researchers over the last year and a half. And there's more to come. And I'm, you know, I want talent. I want the top talent. And I also want faculty who are entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a question from our audience here about how long does it take for uh, something in research to translate into a drug? And I know there's a daunting answer to this, but... It's at least 10 years. It's at least 10 years. You know, it'd be great to be able to shorten that, that time. And it, it has been shortened, for, certainly for biologics, right? Because there you don't have as many worries about um, safety, the, the risk-benefit ratio in somebody who has metastatic cancer Right, is very different than chronic treatment for hyperlipidemia, for example, where you're going to really have to be very careful if you're going to treat somebody on a day-to-day -day basis. You've got to be very sure that you don't have... Um, I don't know what that condition is, but I hope I never do. High <laughs> it's high, high triglyceride cholesterol. Okay. Oh, well, the statins there was, a, there was pretty... a donut out there, so I hope... <laughs> 
I hope not. Look, I'm um, a chocoholic, so I can't really. Uh... So let, let's, uh, I'll end with a, a, a final question here, which is how did we win you over from Harvard to get you over to Cornell? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I'd been in Harvard for, for a long time, starting when I was 17 and an undergraduate. Uh, went to medical school there as well and trained there. And uh, when, when this job opportunity came up to be the dean at Wall Cornell, um, it was very attractive. It was exciting because there was a new building underway. And the goal the, the, the was let's build a first-rate biomedical research enterprise and in my mind, I felt that was a place where we could, we could really say, let's do high class, first class, translational research, which frankly, I don't even distinguish from basic research. It, this is a continuum. Everybody needs to be talking to everybody else. And we've set up the new research building, so that's going to happen. Great. Well, I hope we can. Thanks for having part. me. Yeah, thanks again. <laughs>